So my name is Connor. I'm, I live in Melbourne. I work in a, in, a, in a Catholic school called the Catholic College. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of ACES. ACES was created one year ago. And I'm very happy to see um, co-committee members here as well. And I just want to thank Kevin for organising this gathering. Now, I've been praying for this to be happening in the, in the last five years and it's happened. So thank you very much, Kevin. I'm delighted. I'm sure we are all delighted from what you've put together. I want to say from the beginning that I'm not classically trained. Um, I'm not an expert, but I'm learning. I'm learning. So Kevin has asked us to address two, two school-based challenges and two school-based opportunities. So I will go with challenge one. And forgive me for look at my notes. <coughs> Teachers are not classically trained in Australia. They have not received a liberal arts education. They don't have a broad-based education, and sadly, many have not read the great books. Especially in the high school years, teachers see themselves as specialist subjects, the things that we've been hearing since the morning. For example, I'm a maths teacher. I teach science. What teachers in Australia don't understand is that classical teachers don't teach subjects, I'll say this slowly, arts. They teach the seven liberal arts. Grammar, logic, rhetoric, arithmetic, astronomy, music and geometry. Now these, I'll say this again, these are tools of learning. Tools of learning, not subjects, not discrete subjects. There are interconnections between subjects and that is a mental framework required from each classical teacher. So that's challenge number one. Challenge number two. Students in Australia are culturally and educationally ill-equipped to learn using a classical pedagogy. What does that mean? They have poor logical thinking skills. They lack rigorous thinking and studying in general. They go to school to get a job, and that's it. This can be attributed to their parents, who also have not had a classical education. Parents will be fiercely opposed, this is a challenge, to their children receiving a classical education. I just want Johnny to become a successful barrister. Full stop. So the challenge is, how do we slowly change that mentality in both students and parents? We need to look at both groups, students and parents, especially parents. Ultimately, the decision lies with the parent being fully convicted, convinced, that class education is the way to go. All right. Opportunities. Opportunity one. Now, this ties in with my first challenge. And I have put some of these on your table. So we at ACES here, what have we done? We have begun offering opportunities for professional development to teachers who wish to be classically trained. I want to thank Kevin. I want to thank Paul. I want to thank David. They spoke at our first April conference. We had over 100 Australians. Over a hundred Australians from all states and territories gathered to hear, hear about classical education. That tells me something. Last month, a group of 10 teachers across Australia, principals, teachers, enrolled in the Paidea Pedagogy Certification course with Dr. Robert Woods. Karina is one of them, I'm one of them. Why are we doing this course? Again, it comes back to that professional development. I want to be classically trained. If a classical school opens in Melbourne two years trained, I need to have that framework. I need to know exactly what it means to be a classical teacher. This is an opportunity where teachers are able to enrich their understanding about classical pedagogy, in this case, the Paidea approach, which is based on Mortimer Adler. And guess what? Mortimer Adler converted to Catholicism. Not many people know this. Mortimer Adler became a Catholic in the final years of his life. That tells me something. Mortimer Adler was the pioneer of the classical education renewal in America. We need to study his books. Mortimer Adler. By learning from the Americans, 
we Australians can then gradually train other teachers. We need to start. That's how we're doing these development, professional developments. And I always say this to the committee members. We need to learn from the masters. In this case, the masters are the Americans. Let's be honest. They've been doing this for 40 years. So we are the apprentices. Then once we become competent, then we can teach other Australian teachers. So imagine one day Karina and I and a few others who have done this Paideia course get 10 teachers and say, look, we're going to teach you the Paideia model based on Mortimer Adler. That's what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. Because we're Australians. And even David Kern from Cersei said that kind of eventually when classical education takes off in your country, it has to be an Australian classical education. Don't base it on us Americans. We're Americans. You're Australians. So that's what we need to tether for the next couple of years. What do we mean by an Australian classical education? Not an American. We learn from the Americans, but we always come back to what it means for Australia. Okay, opportunity two. This ties in with my second challenge. Students are enthused by an education with a strong sense of purpose and integration so that even a compromised classical education will be welcomed by many but would work particularly with primary age students. And I commend what's happening at Hakua. When more primary schools come into classical education, there will be then more secondary schools that will follow. So let's create strong classical primary schools and then slowly it will drag on. Catholic schools offer acceleration and enrichment programs already. Even sports academies, well done. So the opportunity now is for Catholic schools to offer more interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, cross-curricular, the way we heard today, units of work. And Fiona gave us an example. Where two or three teachers plan a unit of work together and teach this unit. It can be called Classical studies. That's what it can be called. It can be called humane studies. English, history, maths, philosophy, theology, science can all be integrated. Back to what Paul said. Not discrete subjects. <clears throat> Let's troll it at some schools. I'll give another example. This is another opportunity, and I love, I love Kevin's question. I work at Colby Castle College. At the moment, I teach the Ignite program. What's IGNITE? Accelerated Learning Program. At the moment, dear friends, I'm doing the PIDEA course, three months course, with Kepler Education America. So guess what? I would like to, after three months, go up to my principal and say, I've just done a PIDEA fully enriched course. Am I able to offer a classical studies course at Colby Catholic College? Can we take a group? Can I take those IGNITE students? Can I take that and do something with those Ignite students? Other schools call it different else. That can be an example. That's an opportunity, Kevin, where I can do that with the Ignite group. I mean, I'm already, I'm already teaching Ignite at Colby Catholic College. Catholic schools can offer parent information workshops. Imagine in this room we had now 60 parents from Melbourne listening to what we're saying about this. We might be able to win their hearts. And then those 60 parents will tell their friends and their parents. And that's how it grows. That's how it happened in America. So we need to target the parents. Imagine the whistles that we get parents in every region. We're having a workshop about classical education. Come down. Listen. You might learn something. We're getting close to time. Yeah. Almost finished. Look, there's a lot for other. Look, I just want to thank you. And look, I want to, I want to finish with this. I'm so proud and privileged to be working in the Catholic system. I've been working in Catholic Ed for the last 10 to 15 years. I don't want to leave the Catholic education system. I don't want to go to the state system. Never. I want to remain in the, in the Catholic system. However, I want to enrich it. Class education is one way of enriching it. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Who wants to be next? <laughs> I started to move. <laughs> Okay, uh, so my name is uh, Matthew Harrodin. Uh, I'm a uh, school leader and um, school teacher in Melbourne's East. 
and uh, actually I've been here quite a bit because uh, teachers in, in, um, in Melbourne come here for their professional development. So I've done lots of different PD in here over the past seven years, but, uh, but none in, in classical education. Um, so um, I'll talk about a couple of opportunities and, and, and challenges. I might leave out one challenge because uh, we just, uh, Fiona mentioned something about curriculum, so I might leave that one out. Um, but uh, I wanted to go um, talk about the first opportunity that I think. And um, <clears throat> I've written down that classical education, I think, is intrinsically interesting um, and it's transdisciplinary. And I'll go into that in a moment. So I'm a father of six and... Um, I've got four of my children attend schools um, in both the Catholic system and in the, in the independent system. And when Mary was giving her presentation, uh, she had the three logos for the three schools, and I have one of one child in each of those uh, three schools at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my son, and in fact, we're trans here, so, so all my kids have had principals who are uh, here with us today. Um, my son, who was in year three, uh, came home the other week and he couldn't stop talking about Athens um, and Sparta and the various features of their um, societal um, structures and the different roles that women had in, um, in those two cities. He talked about what a democracy was and he talked about how um, uh, uh, the Spartans um, didn't have the democracy that the, that the Athenians did um, and he was completely obsessed with it and he came home and he, and he drew pictures and he and he just went on and on at the dinner table. And um, he studied this uh, at, in a subject called History of Culture. And um, History of Culture, where they, they read the story of the world text, who, whom a lot of you would be familiar with. Um, and uh, his teacher, I called him up the other day, and he said that um, it's everyone's favourite subject at the school. And I think, I think I know why. It's because it has that intrinsic interest in nature about it when these kids are studying these things. Um, his teacher also told me that some of the, year, uh, some of the boys in, in one of the other classes were moved to tears upon the ending of the original Robin Hood. And that just really got me thinking about the power that the great books have. Because I, I, I mean, I'm teaching for seven years and, and I think the only reason a kid would have cried after reading the book was that it was finally over. Um, you know, so I don't think I've ever kind of, you know, had that and you know it's refreshing to hear students so reflect so intimately with a text's aesthetic moral um and literary beauty you know rather than being prompted to dissect it against uh, you know some moral criteria today um mm -hmm. which many texts which many which we wish we do um I think that one of the benefits of classical education is that it is interesting, morally edifying, and this notion of transdisciplinary. In my experience, students love hearing the stories of the past, of heroes, and siege cities of the rise and fall of various world civilizations and texts of the greatest writers of our past. I ran a session last term with my student on moral dilemmas, where I presented them with various trolley, um, uh, trolley problem style conundrums in moral philosophy. My students loved it, and it but I could see it really made them think about where their moral um, conclusions stem from. It's as though they wanted to tell me that it was from their Judeo-Christian heritage, but they were too uh, apprehensive about saying so. It's like they didn't want to admit that. And this is at the year five, six. This is at year five, six level. It's as though they, they felt there was something wrong about saying that this is where it came from, even though they were halfway there. Furthermore, I find it interesting that the critics of classical education point towards its emphasis on content um, rather than process. So, you know, this is shift about students constructing their own knowledge through inquiry style process um, rather than being recipients of knowledge by a teacher, which we've kind of talked about. And I, I feel like this constructivist approach can present some flaws because it can gloss over the importance of actually committing to memory facts which are important. Um, and classical education isn't merely about the facts of the past. I believe it presents a real authentic opportunity for transdisciplinary learning where students can study the best Western writers and thinkers of our past, but at the same time use it as, authentic, as an authentic springboard to learn skills in other um, disciplines, such as geography and mapping. Uh, mathematics, STEM, they could design the house of, uh, of, of, of one of the uh, characters in their book using computer-aided design. There's no reason why they can't use this knowledge to kind of build up their skills in other areas. Um, the opportunities are endless. So 
with our utilitarian and workforce orientated mindset towards education, I think that people might be looking into this past as a bit of a backward thing to do. Um, but um, I, th I think that the classical education is certainly a 21st century education. It's, it's a not looking back into our past in, in the negative sense. Um, I don't think there's any reason to believe um, that a classical education signifies a markedly different, uh, different departure from teaching students skills that will be useful in their future careers. Many of these dispositions and skills that we are asked to teach are best taught within the subject, within a subject domain anyway. Um, opportunity two. Um, as a teacher of seven years, I believe students thrive on objectivity, whether that be objectivity about the rules of a game, objectivity about expectations of the classroom, about how to act and how to think about the world. What I'm finding is that this, there's a certain relativism that creeps into the classroom through this idea of choice. And I don't think students particularly thrive on the idea that they are making up the rules as they go. For example, we're student, encouraging students to co-construct um, classroom expectations, co-construct school rules, and co-construct the assessment criteria for their own work. I'm not suggesting these are necessarily disagreeable things to do, as I do them myself as I'm required to do in my own teaching. But I think they can undermine how students perceive the idea that there ob exist objective truths about the world, especially in the area of morality. So I think students need a moral grounding in something immutable, unchanging and reliable. They need to be able to predicate and evaluate their actions against an ethical foundation. And um, I think the virtues is a really good way to do that, as we've mentioned before. Um, I might just move on to, um, to a, a bit of a, a challenge. Um, I think this is notion of um, cultural um, self, um, a, a lack of cultural self-belief that's kind of uh, creeping in at the moment. And um, I'm kind of talking about this in the context of even, even the, on the prime school level. Um, so I'll start off with an analogy. So primary school students love to celebrate um, from swimming carnivals to athletics days to classmates' birthdays, various weeks and days like NADOC week, Are You OK Day and Harmony Day, all these kind of things. I haven't even had my students clap and cheer at me when my TV decided to, to go into standby mode and there was a countdown and I was on the other side of the classroom and I rushed to touch the screen before it actually went on to, you know, turned off completely. And they loved them and they clapped and cheered about that. You know, and, um, and for those of us that live in the West, you know, there's a lot to be happy about, to be grateful about, to be proud about. And I think that's, I think that's something that's... Um, um, I think uh, you mentioned it before, Fiona, about um, uh, human progress, about it being uplifting, because I think that so much of it nowadays, when we perceive it, can be so negative. Like, we don't have to talk about the progress of the West as being so negative. Like, our students really need to see it as uplifting. So I, I kind of feel like... These primary school students are celebrated. They're, they're happy students that need reasons to celebrate their things about the world, not continually dissect it for various things. And I think that this pessimism is kind of creeping in, and I can see it in year five, six, more and more each year. Um, and I think they lack this cultural self-belief because they're surrounded by a society that kind of is emphasising this, this cultural you know, lack of belief in the, in the progress that their own culture is, is taking them in. Um, and I find that uh, kind of funny when I, I have a bit of a chuckle to myself whenever I get my students and I say something like, all right, can the girls go first, please, and go line up at the door? And then someone goes, oh, Mr. Harrington, that's sexist. Or I might say something, all right, the boys, can I just grab your pencil cases first? And, I, you know, they don't, they don't know what they're saying, but I kind of feel like the kids are trying to find an issue more and more with the things around them, with the issue with... with uh, because we give them self-agency, so we're kind of actually encouraging them to see issues in... In, in things these days, and um, um, you know, I, I just find that uh, I find that very interesting. Um, anyway, lots of our pedagogy is centred around finding problems. Like the inquiry model often stems from actually a prompt about a problem first, um, and the, sometimes that can be good because the, the by presenting a problem first, you get the students to think critically about things. Um, but I think that. Um, but what we need more of is learning that it does exist for the sake of learning. And I think that's where the classical education comes into it because it's good for the mind and soul. 
and that learning that appreciates the history and origins of why um, the West came to be. I think we need to allow students to see the links between their society and the influence of the past because I think there's a lot to be proud about, um, about our cultural past and our classrooms can be a place um, where they can foster this cultural self-belief. And I think through that, we can um, begin to turn things around. I've got a bit more to say, but I think I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name's Therese Mount. Um, my background is um, that I did an art science degree from Melbourne Uni. Um, I majored in Spanish and history, um, anatomy and physiology, and then I went to do a dip ed. I taught for two years at St Pat's in Ballarat, um, and then I went back and did my honours in science and neuroscience. Uh, decided to go back into teaching, taught for six years at Sacre Coeur, um, mainly math, science, um, chemistry for VCE and RE. Um, and I've just finished a term at um, uh, Mary McKillop in Wagga, but now I'm back in Melbourne. So um, I'm going to be pretty brief, but two opportunities, two challenges. Um, so I think a classical education model would provide Catholic schools the opportunity to reclaim their Catholic identity. Often I think the leadership in Catholic schools often sense something isn't quite right with the state and national curriculum, um, but aren't able to properly articulate what it is and how to respond to it. Given classical education is focused on truth and aims to explore truth in all its forms, it would naturally fit in, a, in with a Catholic view of life. If an alternative curriculum was well formed and structured and ready to go, I think quite a number of Catholic and Christian um, principles and leadership would be open to using it. So that's one sort of opportunity there, that groundwork is there and I think some people would adopt it if they were given something ready to go. Another opportunity which I think a classical education provides is um, yeah, just fulfilment for students. From my experience, young people light up when a deeper topic is discussed. I have seen students become despondent with um, politically correct content and content which is superficial and vague. While I think research projects are good activities for students um, as it teaches them to distill information and identify good and poor resources in their research. Um, at times I believe these types of assignments are given too often and students become tired with having to teach themselves the content. I found students, especially those below year 10, love board notes, um, love learning content and enjoy the satisfaction of completing old fashioned comprehension questions. Um, a roadblock to implementing a classical model Maybe a school's reluctance to sacrifice, sacrifice high ATAR scores. I'm not saying that a classical model would um, necessarily lead to lower final year results. However, it appears to me that a classical model would encourage students to choose their subjects based upon their interest um, and love, rather than upon how well they perform in it and how this particular subject will be scaled and contribute to their ATAR. Um, moving away from this outcomes focused model may be difficult uh, for some schools to adopt quickly as a lot of their marketing is centred upon ATAR results um, and things like that. Um, it may also be quite difficult for schools to abandon their devotion to inquiry based learning. From my experience this mode of learning has dominated the teaching profession in the last um, 20 years or so. Even, yeah, so many school Buildings are designed with this style in mind with open learning spaces um, which are meant to enc encourage collaboration and teamwork. A lot of the curriculum, especially in maths, is more geared towards allowing students to find the answers and changing this attitude would be a big shift and some schools may be very slow in transitioning. So it's kind of like literally built into the school. They've built in these open space learning um, things and obviously they want to go with it because they've spent so much money on it. But, yeah, and they probably believe in it too. Um, lastly, just reflecting upon my teaching career, I think one of the most concerning things um, for me that I saw was seeing students abandon subjects they enjoy because they were worried about their future, their ATAR, their career, etc. I have seen countless capable students drop out of more difficult subjects even though they enjoy them. 
um, simply because they want to get the easier mark. I find this really sad um, because from my own experience it takes time to learn certain concepts. Only after many years of studying certain subjects did I better understand what was going on. Um, however, personally, the sense of achievement that comes when the penny finally, finally drops made it worthwhile. Um, I feel a lot of students aren't afforded that opportunity to lo slowly persevere through content um, because they're worried about that immediate grade. So, yeah, so just for example, I taught Year 10 Maths for quite a while and there was just a massive drop-off from um, kids just going into further rather than the methods, the, the harder maths, I guess, where I could just see, I was like, you, you would really enjoy doing methods in Year 11, even though it's going to be a struggle. I just know you're not going to enjoy the further, but they're like, yeah, but Miss Mount, I really want the, the higher score and, and all that. And that happened heaps, like with chemistry and, and all that sort of stuff. And I knew, like even when I was at school, I was like, oh, chemistry is so hard. But looking back, I was so glad I did it. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is classical ed would perhaps encourage that love of learning, love of the subject, expanding the mind, challenging them, rather than, um, yeah, that career utilitarian sort of focus of education, which has sort of crept in. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say. <laughs> no, no, keep going. Keep going. That's all right. So, any questions, comments? You've had three today, I think. <laughs> There's one in every class. Kevin, you should have given him the spot. Come on, Tim. Tim first. Just ripping off very quickly, Con, you talked about the Australian classical education, and Karina, you talked about this moment. Um, recently, OECD criticised us for having an education that's a mile wide and an inch deep, but we're going to produce a million robots by robotic teenagers by the end of this decade. Well, um, I, Karina, I love your enthusiasm, and you know that. And, uh, I, I truly think you're right, but even a small group like this, and of course we know that it's a bigger group, not everyone can be here. Um, I do think we can turn around Australian education and, and getting back to the point I said that Paul mentioned, made you think or something, you know, about working out where we are as a nation and where we're going and, and what our symbols are. <coughs> um, some might, won't be shocked that I am a Republican, so I sort of think about symbols. And um, I think it's really important what you just said about turning this big ship around. And the good thing about Australia is that we actually are a small population. So we're like a little lighthouse in a way, if we think about the global picture in the Western world. And we can turn Australia around. So the lighthouses, like the little school we're starting, and, and the great pirate schools we've heard about in other schools, we're all little lighthouses in a bigger lighthouse, which is Australian education. And I think we so can, what's the question? If we're positive, we can turn it around. So I'm just excited by what you guys just said. <laughs> Fabulous. No, thanks for that. And down in the back, I think there was one. Oh, yes, and um, thank you for all your contributions. That were great. Um, as high school teachers or as primary school teachers as well, um, what's one small practical contribution do you think you could make to the school where you're currently at or where you have worked to inch it slowly towards a more classical form of learning? One so we'll start with me. Karin. Okay. Yes. Um, I hopefully I, I gave just a small insight into because once my door is closed, I actually do what I want. Um, <laughs> but but one thing that I I put in a proposal to my English hod to actually start a What's great a hod? Uh, head of head of department yeah. my English head of department. Sorry, <laughs> teacher acronym um, <laughs> is to actually start a great books program. I'm just not going to call it that, which will be off curricular, or like off timetable, I should say. Yeah. And what do they say to that? So uh, well, uh, well, I've, I've got a very sympathetic um, English hod, and she's quite excited about it. Does yes. she know it's the great books in disguise? Um, yeah. No. So what did you call it? Interesting. Um, <laughs> Some books. Well, yeah, no, I just, well, I, I think I, I haven't given an official title, but I've just passed it as an idea of, of giving them an insight, a taste. Uh, she, I mean, she's a voracious reader herself, and I said because our, you know, our curriculum does lots of mostly modern, and I said let's let's just do some foundational things, and um, she said yeah, great, yeah. So note that she was fine with it, yeah. 
But it's not part of the curriculum for No, no, it's off timetable. Off timetable. So yeah. the curriculum, sorry to keep interrupting, but it's okay. I'm a bit ignorant on this matter, no, it's quite it's interesting. Right. Does the curriculum then dictate which books you have to teach and they're not sort of classic texts these okay. days? I, I mean, I know that sounds like a really rudimentary question, but just No, no, it's, but them. it's not. No, and, and, I, and I think, and this is where I liked one of the questions that Diff asked earlier about what, what we suffer from, and I think that's the correct verb to use, is that there are set texts that we have to do in senior. So, like, because of the car, because of um, QCAA. So I'm from Queensland, obviously. And um, so, but what happens now in most schools, they're backward mapping everything. So the children where I teach, um, it's all very, very modern texts. Um, and, and quite literally, I'm, I'm doing, uh, like, I teach senior English, but I teach essential English. And um, they will not have ever looked at Shakespeare. They've never done ancient Rome. They've never done ancient Greece. And very little poetry. Oh, no, no, unless the, the poetry that I bring in class, that will be the only poetry apart from maybe one or two perhaps Indigenous. Yeah. Just quickly, the other point there, because I taught literature for many years, and I gave up in the end because instead of the moral or the aesthetic value or the cultural value in terms of Western culture, it was all about deconstructing or critiquing texts. So even if you do, you know, Romeo and Juliet, you deconstruct it in terms of heteronormativity. Mm. The fact that it's a relationship between a young boy and a young girl, and that privileges heteronormativity mm. and a binary sense of sexuality and gender, and is offensive to the LGBTQI plus people. Quite right. <coughs> right, so there you go. <laughs> Therese. Uh, well, I was just thinking about maths, um, especially in Year 7. So you get, you know, kids from all different primary schools in when they come to, you know, my experience of Saprika in Year 7 maths. And I think what I sort of just pushed back on and which I thought worked was getting the kids to just do memorisation a lot, like uh, know their times tables, get them up to speed with the basic skills. Um, even in RE, I just got them to memorise the Ten Commandments and recite them to me. So it was just like, kind of push back with those simple tasks, like memorisation, because at that age, they are just like so keen, and it's like, just get them when they're at that age. So, yeah. Right. Um, I think at the primary school level, it's, it's, primary school is pretty good because there's actually a lot of flexibility because it's, it's not so subject oriented as is, is in secondary and um, you can kind of have discussions with students more because you're the only classroom teacher you know that they'll likely have unless you're, you're kind of part time in a year but so I think the first step in my opinion for primary would be the, um, the virtues because they can fit in really well with the school's existing framework on student well-being um, and, um, and you can kind of you know, you can have it as simple as this week, guys, we're going to work on the, the virtue of prudence and I can kind of discuss it just after I do the role with my with my students and it doesn't really impact any of the lessons I'm, I'm going to do after that, but it's just a little thing you can do and then just put up in the next thing. We're going to do courage this week and just mm. rotate that through a year. So you just do, you know, real simple stuff on um, on the virtues as a good entryway into, um, you know, into classics, I suppose. Cool. Yes. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I teach Year 9 Ignite at my Catholic school at the moment, so I would like to introduce a Socratic seminar. The reason why I say that is because, as I, I told you earlier, I'm doing the course with more than my, about more than my Adela, about the Paideia model. And like Karina mentioned earlier, that Karina mentioned coaching, the, the Socratic seminar, and also the lecture. So I want to start doing that, Johnson, the Socratic seminar with my Year 9 students. Um, there's a class of 20, so I'll probably have them in groups of two uh, of 10, and just asking those questions, those probing questions, those deep questions. It's not just the questions, it's also giving them a chance to respond. And not just, and it's and before I finish, it's not just me asking the questions, it's them asking each other the questions. It's not just the teacher, it's them leading, it's them asking the questions as well. So any other yeah. questions? <laughs> if not, thank you very much. And the